Welcome to the Five These Times, a podcast dedicated to the easy task of tackling the 21st century. It is a project born out of my conviction that doing so requires an interdisciplinary and intersectional approach to understanding our complex world. I'm your host, Jerry Ayub, and in these episodes, I bring you conversations at the intersection of politics, history, philosophy, culture, science, and all the fun stuff in between. The following episode was first published for monthly Patreon supporters. To become a monthly Patreon supporter, please head out to patreon.com slash times or check the website for other methods. You can become a supporter for as little as $1 a month. And if you cannot donate, you can still support this project by sharing with your friends and family and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. The music of this podcast is by Tarabit. Here's the episode. So this is a conversation about cars. <laughs> um, well, not really, but kind of. This is a conversation about the systems that have made our world so dependent on cars. So it's a conversation with, with Giulio Mattioli and Julia Steinberg about their article, The Political Economy of Car Dependence, a Systems of Provision Approach, which was published in the Energy Research and Social Science Journal uh, some, some months ago. We discussed a number of topics that might seem at first kind of out of context, maybe, I'm not sure, but um, just bear with me. So these are the topics. We discussed the five key elements of what we're calling the car dependent transport system. We discussed the problem with focusing too much on consumption and the importance of covering the production side of things as well. We discussed how where we live can actually influence our politics, how suburban car oriented lifestyles, for example, are actually subsidized by the state. Then we discussed broader topics, uh, the importance of network planning, the case for degrowth and how the car industry is actually a pretty good example of why degrowth is necessary. We look at the problem with sustainable growth. We even even discuss why more equitable societies are easy to decarbonize and a number of other things. The idea here is that we look at the political economy of car dependence and use that as our anchor in this conversation to discuss these broader issues. Because the world we live in, a world that is so focused on cars, uh, in, in similar ways as how we live in a world that's so dependent on aviation, and here I might uh, recommend listening to episode 65, A Rapid and Just Transition of Aviation Shifting Towards Climate Just Mobility. These are all highly political issues that are often uh, depoliticized in, for lack of a better word, mainstream discourse, and indeed even in academia and even in activism. In fact, one of the reasons why I invited my two guests on to talk about this topic is that I think we often fall into a trap on the left in general of not understanding that consumption can be a problem. And in fact, consumption is a problem a lot of the times. It doesn't mean that it is the only problem. And indeed, as I said in this introduction, we say that it is a problem when we focus too much on consumption, especially if it comes at the risk of ignoring the importance of covering the production side of things. As with some of these episodes that have to do with the environment, this is a case, or I'm trying to make the case, that when we talk about the environment, it is difficult to do so without also discussing the context in which these questions are happening. So the issue with cars, isn't cars themselves, but the fact that we live in a world that was built for them, for the prioritizing car mobility. So what does this mean? This is what a systems of provision approach tries to do. This is what we tried to get into in this conversation. As with these episodes, those that might seem more quote unquote specialized at first, I hope you just give them a listen because I think we make a very good case that it's not actually that specialized. It doesn't require you to know that much or to have some kind of like advanced knowledge of what we're talking about in order to follow this conversation and hopefully find it productive. So that's it for me, folks. Uh, Thank you for listening and take care. I am Giulio Mattioli. I'm a research fellow at the TU Dortmund University in Germany. And uh, hi, I'm uh, Julia Steinberger. I'm a professor at the University of Lausanne and the Institute of Geography and Sustainability. All right, well, thank, thank you both for speaking with me. We'll be primarily chatting around the paper that you two co-wrote, and we'll use this to, you know, broaden conversation a bit as well. Uh, so the paper is called The Political Economy of Car Dependence, a Systems of Provision Approach. Um, Julia, on Twitter, you described the goal of the paper as such, and I'm quoting, uh, to understand how different industries and policies come together to create the consumption of cars. We argue that the real product of our age is not the automobile, but automobile dependence. 
And then you ask, how is this dependence created and fostered? And the paper is our answer, end quote. So with that in mind, uh, can you both explain what the, just the general gist of the paper uh, before we can get into it a bit more? You know, like what, what is it about and why did you feel the need to write it as well? I guess I can tell sort of the, the long backstory, and then and then maybe Julia can Julia can go through the the how we actually turned it into something quite wonderful. Um, so the the long backstory is that I try to research the energy requirements of well-being, which is a weird topic. Um, maybe it's getting to be a bit less weird. Um, but one of the things that was clear in this research is that the energy requirements of well-being might not be very high or might be declining over time. So paradoxically, it actually probably takes less and less energy to, for people to live well. But uh, one of the things that was going the other direction was transport. So transport is this category that people feel that they need a lot, but transport and transport energy is going up. And uh, the funny thing to me was when I would come to people with this result of like, hey, guess what? Good news, it, the energy requirements of human development are going down over time. Everybody would be like, okay, well then our energy use should be decreasing. What's so I had to come up with a way to answer about what was standing in the way. And the thing that's standing in the way is our economy and the way it uses resources and transforms it into consumer goods. And one of the ways that that happens is through transport. And so it seemed like transport was a really core um, thing to understand better. And I had no way of doing that. Um, so that is why I... Uh, turn to Julio, who it turns out knows a lot. So, so yeah, my my backstory. It's it's funny how we our paths cross in that way. Is that uh, my main background is in like going really back in sociology and urban studies, but I had been focusing for 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 a while on transport, and my focus had always been like what was standing in the way in a way, like what was standing in the way of like making transport sustainable or reduce emissions in transport and so on. So uh, that goes under the name of car dependence, like all, you know, this idea that we would need to reduce levels of car use um, because, for example, electrification won't be enough. Like we will need to, uh, you know, use cars less, uh, but somehow we find it so difficult to do it. So like my broad interest in is for everything which helps explaining that, but I had never looked at it from a political economy perspective, uh, which I suppose was a bit in the back of my mind, but I'm, uh, I would never have done it. Hadn't there been the, the opportunity to um, work with Julia on this project? Um, so with hindsight, it was a, was a great, great thing that we managed to met at that point <laughs> and, and to do this. Yeah, I mean, I've just finished the entire uh, paper today. Um, it's really, really fascinating. I think it really can it can kind of lead to different um, paths as well, and we'll try and get into some of them here. But like, the gist of it is that you, you identify five key elements uh, of what we will be calling and what you called in the paper the car dependent transport system, and I'll just list them. Uh, the automotive industry, the provision of car infrastructure, the political economy of urban sprawl, the provision of public transport, and finally, cultures of car consumption. Um, first, can I just ask you to expand on these five a bit? Did you even just explain them if that's okay? Uh, and then I, I have a follow-up question to that, but if you can start with that. Uh, yeah, so the, 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 the five, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just go very quickly through them. Uh, so the first one was the automotive industry because we were trying, as I said, so one of the problems with, I think, sustainable transport discourse, and by that I include like both research and also things like activism, that it's very much focused on consumption. So like the idea, so why are people using cars? Why are people buying cars? And why are people buying this kind of car and not that kind of car, etc.? So that's, that's all on the consumption side. So we felt that one key element that was missing was the production side right uh, where, where are all these cars coming from and it's surprising to, 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 to think about that in sustainable transport research it's, it's it, this aspect is very much absent so I think that's one of perhaps of the new things that uh, this paper was trying to do was like to you know look at the literature on that which exists but it's, it's disconnected from the others and try to make the links between that and the other aspects 
Uh, the second point is the car infrastructure, which is like broadly, like it's the idea that, so how did we get to the point where we have 1 billion, I, I, I don't know anymore, like 1 billion cars over this planet? It would never have happened if those had not been accommodated by, you know, first taking road, road street space away from other uses and, and, uh, and, and other modes and making it primarily about car traffic and, and then by building a lot more of road space, right? And that's uh, like, like uh, an element where the state plays a key role in, you know, making sure that these things happen. Um, so the third one, um, yeah, land use patterns. Like it, the, 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 there's a lot of discourse and around sprawl. And uh, if you live if you live in a in a car dependent area where the residential density is very low, uh, it is very difficult to get by without uh, a car. Um, so how did we get to that point? And what are the how does this element relate to all the other different uh, elements? So that was what we were trying to do. Uh, the fourth one was public transport, because we saw as, as the main competitor, so to speak, uh, and we thought there was an, a, a political economy element there as well to to explain. So, in how how do you set up uh, a, a public transport system which is competitive with with the car as as, as much as possible? Uh, that's not something that is politically. It's not just a technical question. You know, there there, there are different models that can be followed there, and and some are more. Are more suited to um, to uh, make sure that um, you know public transport can compete with uh, car use, and the last element was uh, the more cultural one. So everything which is more on the consumption side related to the the the, the meanings associated with uh, using cars, buying cars, and so on. Because we thought that that's that's a very important element. Although I mean sometimes it's it's its importance it's exaggerated when it's you know sometimes people pretend that you know this whole thing about cars it's just that people uh develop a love affair with the car that's a that's a common expression you know? just people just love them and that's it uh so that's exaggerated but there's certainly a lot of like cultural aspects which are you know linked with the all the other bits in interesting ways uh and fortunately we had i just wanted to name him like we had cameron roberts who's like the co-author and who like uh, I mean that he was uh, like the main author of of, of that section, really, because we would never have managed to like um, to uh, write about those cultural aspects. Uh, I, I wouldn't have that. That's not my forte. So these are the five elements. And maybe I can also add something in terms of the story of the paper, which was uh, so. I remember the first time we sort of sat down to talk about it, Julia sort of walked into the office and he said, "You know, this is an insane thing." Um, <laughs> And, uh, but if we want to do it, we have to include at least these five aspects. And by the way, one of them, I don't really know how to do, which is the cultural one. So we sort of parked that one for a while. But there's also the uh, missing aspects that we sort of decided not to include in the scope of the study, which have to do um, with the petroleum industry. So the fossil fuel industry, all the energy and metal supplies upstream of the car industry. So all that sort of um, stuff that's upstream of either the car creation or the car production or the car use we didn't look at so we sort of looked from the 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 the, the um, yeah from the automotive industry and then not further um because we just had to draw a boundary around it not because those elements are not interesting just because we had to sort of say okay this is crazy enough related to this actually you, you mentioned in in the paper you look at how sprawl quote unquote drives politics i appreciate the pun here by the way <laughs> as those who, who live in those areas, suburban areas, middle-class areas, are more likely to support uh, quote-unquote hidden subsidies. I'm going to use a lot of these terms, so if it's okay, I'll, use, I'll ask you to also explain them. Um, so let me repeat. As those who live in these areas are more likely to support hidden subsidies to automobility and oppose investment in alternative modes. And here is a quote. Suburban car-dependent areas have supported policies that reduce subsidies to public transport, maintain the quote-unquote hidden welfare state, supporting sprawl and automobility and preserve the cause domination of street space, end quote. So if we, so if we were having cultural conversations, you know, we might talk about, uh, I mean, I guess I can read, you know, the, the car industry actively supporting the development of car culture, both liberty, advertising and so on. I can think of it just shows like Top Gear and just the popularity of cars being a thing to 
to enjoy and consume and, and all of that. Okay, we, so this will be one conversation, but the infrastructure level tends to be less uh, focused on, or the structural level tends to be less focused on. And this is something like this quote that I read, like uh, suburban car dependent areas, support policies that, that would prioritize car infrastructure, let's say, or car friendly infrastructure rather than public transports is something that I've seen, but I've never fully connected the dots in some way. So can, can I just ask you to expand on that a little bit? So yeah, in, in that section, I'm, I'm drawing on the work of this uh, geographer from uh, Toronto, which is uh, Alan Walks. And he's uh, primarily, I think he came to this topic by looking at the increasing polarization in uh, voter behavior between uh, urban areas and suburban areas. So that's something that at least in English speaking countries, it's, it's, it's very clear. Uh, I think it, it's clear in other countries as well, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I can't say it, it applies to all countries 100%. Uh, but they definitely see from the 70s to now, like, say in the 70s like cities were not were not much more labor in the uk than than conservative uh but now they are right and and the suburbs uh, are, are really really much more conservative than labor as as compared to what they used to be so there's there, there's been a trend in that direction and there's a debate in geography as far as i understand as to why why it, that is happening and w one explanation is like people have um sort of sorted themselves into you know um people who have that kind of political preference also happen to prefer to live in those areas and over time they have like sorted themselves in in spaces that they are more congenial to them uh, i suppose that's part of the answer but this author was arguing that uh the other part of the answer is like just living in those places changes you right uh, that by living in those places say in a, in a home that you own um using a car that you own and, and and buy and so on will make you a bit more averse to uh more um common goods things like social housing or building blocks uh or uh, public transport because you just don't see the point of those things you know they just they're, they're, they're are no use to you as just that's just me trying to put myself in those shoes um, and, and the point about hidden subsidies that like this suburban lifestyle in, in many ways is supported by public money is supported by taxpayers is supported by people who don't live in those areas don't use cars and and so on but it that happens in less visible ways right um than 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 things like public transport or social housing um so yeah, so th those people tend to be very opposed to to the, those alternative things, which they for which they probably don't see the use to them, but they tend to be very adamant about keeping those hidden subsidies, even denying that the, these are subsidies in in the first place. Can you explain a bit what you, what you mean about they would like to keep those hidden subsidies in place? And yeah, there's that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking things like. Uh, yeah, the, the best example of hidden subsidies is always parking, you know, free parking space. Like, it's just something people take for granted that there's the, the huge amounts of free parking space. But parking space is not free at the end of the day because when you, like, force a every residential development to have a certain amount of free parking space, as part of the residential development, that pushes up the costs of the residential development and then eventually people who are buying or renting or uh, those, um, you know, dwellings uh, will end up paying more for the residents than they would otherwise if that free parking space w w was not provided. So that requires a little bit of thinking. And, you know, it's not, it's not clear that, that that free parking space is being given to you by, you know, all those people who are paying more. Uh, it's all happening behind the scenes, but uh, it is happening in that, like, you know, public space is scarce and we are allocating huge amounts of that to just people who who happen to have cars for, for them to park it on. And um, if you try to suggest, let's take away parking space or let, let's price it, then you suddenly, the people in the suburbs are... Um, often, I mean, I don't want to caricaturize, but that they, they can easily uh, be up in arms and be outraged that, that, that something that is so common sense to them is being taken away from them. Uh, so that's just an example of 
what happens when you touch hidden subsidies. And, and I think that because I come from this from a, from sort of a more general economics perspective, I think that there is a, there is definitely a class element of this, so that we have um, different economic narratives, right? So we have economic narratives around you know the welfare scroungers, so they receive the overt subsidies they receive housing assistance they might receive preferential you know subsidies for public transportation whatever those are obviously infrastructures that are for less well-off people but upper classes who live in houses you know often single or double family units or whatever in in more suburban areas they're going to have more money and they are actually going to be the great beneficiaries of a lot of wealth flows through taxation in general or, or, or through these more indirect hidden mechanisms that we the, that Julia referred to as hidden subsidies, including road building, that's another obvious one, yep. uh, but also things like mortgage tax breaks. Uh, you know that there's there's a whole sort of state support of this idealized lifestyle, and in terms of economic narratives, it's quite possible for people who live in those places to see themselves as self-made, independent, rugged individualists, right? That they see themselves as the self-made people because they they're not there's this polite fiction about the fact that they are not subsidized like people on welfare who live in subsidized housing who depend on public services very uh, openly are 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 benefiting from welfare so so the, it it really reinforces this idea that they are the correct economic actors they are the consumers they are the people with autonomy uh, you know, they are homo economicus effectively, and everybody else is sort of in the, doing economics the wrong way, doing being a household the wrong way uh, from a mainstream economic or mainstream economic narrative perspective. So it really, and if you've read any Anne Rand, it sort of goes in this direction of the, you know, every, everybody in there is the king of the house, is John Galt, is the sort of, that, that whole narrative sort of comes to the fore of, of them seeing themselves really as, um, as, yeah, as, as meriting all of that wealth, all of that dominion, and the car is sort of the, the 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 snail's shell. As you go from place to place, you're always enclosed in your own little personal fortress. So there's a, you know, it it, it reinforces it as opposed to having to deal with anybody else. And if you start touching that, you start touching also a core, not just people's economic interests or their convenience, but also to some extent aspects of their class identity. Uh, and how they how they see themselves being part of society. You're sort of starting to say you don't deserve that stuff that you've been that we've been allowing you to get without making you see that we were in fact paying for it. So so the it makes them realize that they're interdependent and they don't that, that's not what their identity is. So so it's a it's a really um, it's a really interesting conundrum that goes back that goes to basic economic categories. I would say as well. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, the hiding of these categories in some ways, I think. Well, for me anyway, I don't know if it's it's a bit of a simplistic reading, but it's just an example of how what we usually think of economics or mainstream economics is really like one and the same with mainstream politics. At least they kind of go hand in hand. Um, while you were talking, and that may be a caricature, but I was thinking of the during the Black Lives Matter protest in the US, there was that scene where you had this couple and uh, they were protecting their private property and they had a gun and they were invited by the GOP like a week later. Um, <laughs> And that was that was very much that uh, contrast in in very uh, let's say photogenic way. It was very very uh, obvious. Um, but like a lot of what you were getting at as well, if if I'm understanding correctly, uh, Julia, like you tweeted uh, some time ago, um, quote: "Public transport is difficult to provide when land use is car oriented." So you you mentioned that here as well, and then you add: "You need network planning." Uh, which require, but that requires some degree of public control. So, how would you understand uh, network planning? If, that, if that's okay. Right. Yeah. Um, that was part of me. Uh, like when I was preparing this paper, I had the chance to read this book by a guy called uh, Paul Meese, who was a sub. Um, he 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 died, but he uh, was a um, Australian planner, I think. Uh, and he wrote this book, which was, you know, one of those books, I will, I will recommend it at the end of the podcast, uh, but it's one of those books, uh, was a bit of an eye-opening moment. Um, so there's this, in, 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 in transport research, uh, uh, 
also in the common perception, I think there's this idea that like below certain levels of density, you just can't provide for public transport, just not viable, just just won't work. Uh, and I suppose like if you take it to the extreme, yeah, I mean, the, the, there probably is some level beyond which it, uh, but what this book argues is that actually there are ways to provide like for public transport, even in relatively suburban and relatively low density spaces. It just depends on how you do it. Um, it's a bit more difficult, but you need to uh, do this thing, which is called network planning, which is basically trying to uh, look at the whole thing as, as a network. So like integrated network of different um, public transport modes and different routes all um, connected in certain dots, uh, in certain, I mean, in certain exchange points at certain times, et cetera. And that's often not the case when like, it's often the case that services are, are planned in a, in, a, in a disconnected way. It's also a question of like having some feeder services which are not making a profit, like, cause they're running relatively empty. They're not making a profit per se, but they allow you to bring people to those like more um, uh, main services, which do make a profit. And so overall you're cross -subs subsidizing between those. Um, and, and, but in order to do that, so the implication of that, that in order to do that, you need some sort of public oversight and uh, at least uh, some level of, of regulation, right? To, to, to make sure that this crop subsidization uh, happens right and that's not the case in systems that are um, very much deregulated fortunately there, there are not that many of those systems but that there is one in in, in the, the the uk is is a prime example there so the uk has uh outside of um outside of london has uh completely deregulated bus transport uh, so basically, uh, the uh, the bus operators just decide where to run buses, how to run them, at what time, which fare, and so on. And they can, you know, they can change what they do from a week to the next if they want to, etc. Uh, and the public will not uh, will not force them to to provide uh, any services. What the public does is to pick up like the unprofitable routes and pay the bus operators to provide them for them. Um, so basically what Paul Mies is arguing is that if you're going for, for a system like that, there is no way you will ever uh, get uh, a public transport network which is competitive with, with the car, right? And having lived in, a, in Leeds, which is uh, one of the major UK cities, uh, and it's most of which consists of what people would see as relatively suburban areas uh, and it's just just going from point a to point b it's hell like with with buses it's just most um, for, i think for distances of up to 40 minutes an hour if if it's not on the main axis you're just better off walking there right just just and it's very hilly so yeah um so you, you you definitely it's that if you move to the uk from other places where public transport is more planned in a network way like germany uh, and that or, or you move back from the uk to 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 germany you definitely see that like like the difference is like uh like between night and day uh and and that's the difference between a model which is very much privatized and deregulated and and a model which is not entirely public but it's certainly more regulated and where the public has more of uh is more active in um so we just thought that this political economy aspect of public transport provision also fit into into this broader discourse around car dependence well i i guess well i was learning about this mainly through through julio's research and and uh but the thing that really flabbergasted me the most was um, that when they were doing this in the UK, this massive deregulation, um, that they that they spared London, that they knew it was going to be a complete disaster and was going to make cities not function. So even the Thatcher government decided to spare London. So they really they they kept transport for Greater London, which has powers that no other locality in the UK has. And very often, you know, I was in Manchester, I was in Leeds, and people say, like, why can't our city government just do things like London? And it's like, actually, they're not allowed. Like, there's not this understanding that the rest of the country was sort of sacrificed, whereas London was protected. 
in terms of public transportation. I think that that really goes to show that the that the people who did this deregulation actually kind of knew what they were doing uh, when they set up the experiment. Yeah, and it's funny how it happened because, um, like, what what I read is that they so they said let's deregulate, but they said okay, yeah, that let, let, let's first try that outside of London, and then they saw how it was going and said yeah, okay, maybe we won't, won't do it exactly in the same way in London. <laughs> So yeah, there was definitely a bit of, um, uh, um, of um, I think the rest of the UK was a bit of a guinea pig, pig there, <laughs> like Scotland with the poll tax or things like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I lived in London. I, I couldn't imagine that ever. It would be a nightmare. Uh, the tube is, is difficult as it is, but at least it's functional and most people hate, love it. So. I think they they would secretly hate it even more if it was more deregulated. So sort of kind of on a on a on a more um, I don't know macro level or on a broader level, but a big part of this system that um, you know the car dependent transport system, I think it's it's fair to say, um, also relies on the persisting and and dangerous notion in my view that that we can continue to push for economic growth um basically uncritically and and on and basically in an unlimited way despite at this point the the pretty stark and overwhelming scientific evidence that showed the the, the issues with that i would mention um first i would have I would, to kind of ask you your thoughts on on sustainable growth that that buzzword um when is it used recklessly when if ever can it be used in a responsible way I will before asking you that I'll just mention that there was a recent analysis of uh, wait let me find it 835 peer-reviewed articles on the subject of decoupling so for those who don't know the idea that growth can happen without pretty much like without environmental catastrophe and which found that quote this cannot be achieved through observed decoupling rates um, there's a good write-up of this and on the New Republic I'll just link it in, in the description for those who want to read more and yet my understanding as of now anyway is that this mechanism uh, sort of um, is taken for granted, or at least not critical, not not taken critically enough in um, international panels. You know, the World Bank, as far as I know, the UN's Sustainable Development Goals even uh, allow for that kind of 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 um, um, limitation or flaws. I, I I guess I would say I don't know. Um, but for for from your point of view, um, or like even from your <laughs> scientific knowledge. Can you explain what's wrong with this notion, if anything, or how would you nu nuance it a bit more, if that makes sense? I guess that's when that that's uh, that's my question. Um, so I should be completely honest. So I situate myself um, very much on the on the degrowth side of uh, economic scholarship, I guess, um, and. But I came, I, I was looking for decoupling too. I mean, this is, this is the thing is that I was one of those studies where we, you know, we had a bunch of countries and a bunch of data and we're looking for it. And, um, and I think there's a lot of blind faith in this idea. We have, um, I've come to sort of understand it that growth is sort of the, the secular religion of our time that we want good things to, to come from growth. So growth is the purpose of the greater purpose of our collective life. And then we want good things to happen as a result of it. And it's almost like this totem or this central thing that we, we feed and then we expect it to feed us. And um, some basic ideas from that, for instance, came from the, the Kuznets curve. So Simon Kuznets, who was one of the great economists who developed the statistical machinery for measuring GDP, which is a huge work. And GDP is a useful indicator, just not of human progress and welfare, but it's a great indicator of eco aggregate economic activity. You know. And, but he had this idea that inequality first rises with growth and then goes down. And that turned out um, to be true in his time for what he was observing. But as a, hypoth as a general hypothesis, it turned out to be false. But people sort of kept the notion that growth sucks at the, sorry, I'm, I don't know what language we're allowed to use in your podcast. Or, Anything. <laughs> if we're allowed a square, square yes, words or not. Anything's fine. Okay, so that growth sucks bananas at the beginning, like it's gonna come with bad news and bad bad con social consequences, environmental consequences, but afterwards it's gonna be okay. And so people translated this idea of inequality growing with growth, but then decreasing with growth. 
to the environmental sphere. And so there's this idea of sustainable growth, which is, oh yeah, growth is gonna be terrible at the beginning, but once you're past a certain point of prosperity, it's actually gonna help you decouple uh, your environmental impacts. It's gonna help you be cleaner and greener and more prosperous. And uh, so it's, it's just gonna be good all around. And that, that notion is really a zombie theory because people have been demonstrating that it just doesn't work. It works for a very small class of pollutants. Um, you can basically, cat if you look from environmental studies, you can categorize your pollutants in th as three, that in, in terms of their impact on human health. Um, so you have a certain class of pollutants, which would be for instance, that um, cause uh, infectious disease. So that's things like dirty water, uh, things that would spread cholera, things that would spread bacteria. And those just decrease with growth. <laughs> like <laughs> the, the, the infectious disease ones, uh, they, they don't have a, they don't go up with growth, they just go down. They're ones that do go up with growth and then down. And those are the intermediate ones that are, for instance, um, atmospheric pollution in cities that have to do with uh, early stages of industry. Um, those do, so they behave like you would want your environmental cousinage curve to behave. And then they're the ones that just keep growing with growth. And the fact is that the biggest problems we have to do with climate change, biodiversity loss, land use, et cetera, behave in this way where in terms of their, their association with growth, they increase with growth. And in terms of their impact on our health, they're more distant, which is um, they have more of a diffuse global long-term effect, which is why we don't translate them directly into our economy, into our reaction. We don't react as fast as we would with other pollutants that have a more immediate effect on our health. Uh, so, so that's where, that's what we're facing is we're facing, um, I, I completely agree that this idea of sustainable growth is, is a dream. It does not correspond to reality. I completely agree with the, the study, which, um, which looks at these, the, these peer reviewed studies um, across the board. Uh, that they, their, their conclusions are correct. Even when there is decoupling, it's not going fast enough to, kind, to avert the kinds of catastrophes that we're facing. So we have to face a different economic model. And that's where I think the example of car dependence and bringing us back to the automotive industry is really interesting. And, and maybe I'll, I'll just let um, Julio take it from there because one of the things that you see is that every economy, every, most major economies have at their industrial heart, something related to the automotive industry whether they're making parts for it or whether they have actual automa automobile manufacturing. And after each economic crisis that we've seen in the past you know, two decades, one of the ways that the, that the governments try to restart the economy is to keep that industry going at all costs by providing rebates, by doing cash for clunkers, which was like one of the most expensive carbon abatement programs ever per ton carbon. Um, I mean, so they, they do all these things to keep that industry afloat despite the fact that in a recession, people very rationally would prefer to not spend a lot of money on cars. Um, that's something they can save money on right away, then they would do it. So, so there's a, there, and there's a reason why that industry has a hard time degrowing. So that industry is very fragile and in fact demands a growth-based economy, which is also environmentally unsustainable. Um, but maybe Julia can talk more about that. Yeah, I, I I can talk more about that. Um, like so, going back to the automotive industry, one of the things that um, we found out reviewing this literature was that uh, the main so the key to understand it is like capital intensity and economies of scale. Um, so cars, up to a point, they were made of like different materials, including wood, uh, and they were made in different in different. Um, I think the chassis and the other part, I, I, I forgot. I, I'm very bad when it comes like to the specifics of the vehicles, but um, they were made in a different way. And at some point they started to be made as like all steel body. So the idea that there's this like sort of steel bubble, which is a single thing, which, uh, yeah. So that helped with a lot of like production bottlenecks at, at the time. But it created a need for like a lot of so it it, it just works it 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 just make profit out of that production if you really have like a huge factory which chunks out a lot of cars which are made pretty much in the same way so it's got very very high economies of scale um, and that's sort of like 
explains the trajectory of, of, of the car industry since then, which has like been going towards like concentration. There are like, it's a bit more complicated than that, but there are some very, very big uh, like uh, car companies uh, in the world, uh, as opposed to having say thousands of very small ones. And that's because of economies of scale. And that also makes them very unsuited to cope with any fluctuation in demand. So like, um, you know, if, if demand goes up, they will, they, will, they will build a new factory. But if it goes down, they have that new factory, which needs to produce like a, a million vehicles over a certain period of time to just be profitable. So they, they will just produce them and, 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 and cut the margins to, to whatever um, point just helps them to sell them uh, or, or they will ask for subsidies from, from the state, uh, which is how they tend to keep going in, in these downturns. Um, so yeah, uh, there's, um, there's one, uh, like a lot of what we say about the car industry in, in that paper is based on the research of, of mainly two guys, who, two researchers, um, Peter Wells and Paul Neuenheis. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Apologies if I am not. Uh, but they have uh, a lot of books about it. Um, and one of them from 2003, where they have this sentence which stuck with me and which used in the paper, which is like, it's not like a specific product which is unsustainable, right? Like the internal combustion engine vehicle or the SUV, say it's, it's the whole logic of the automotive industry, which is unsustainable because it's geared towards producing more and more and more and more and more of, of, of those vehicles, uh, regardless of, of any consequence, really. Uh, and there is no way to, to say to, um, ha I don't know how to put it, to just, you know, to control that reaction and to harness it in a positive way. It's just, it's just that, the tendency towards overcapacity and overproduction is just it's just too strong um, in a way. Uh, but there's uh, something else I wanted to say about growth and degrowth, um, just go, going back to that point, if I may, uh, is um, I'm not as uh, outspoken as, as Julia in, in these debates, uh, mainly, although I have, you know, clearly I'm more sympathetic to the, to the degrowth side. The reason why I'm not as outspoken is because I, I don't feel qualified enough because um, I'm more of a sectoral specialist, right? And as long as we're talking about transport, I, I, I can state my, my, my point of view with a certain self-assurance. But if we're going be beyond that, um, and, um, I'm not as qualified. But what I would say is that if you were to pick a sector to make a case for degrowth, you would probably pick transport, right? Because like transport is... Uh, as compared to other sectors like domestic housing and so on, it just really shows that over time increases in travel activity have systematically negated like any increase, uh, any improvement in energy efficiency, in carbon intensity and so on. And that's just been the story of transport since we've had motorized transport, right? Uh, so there's a lot of, you know, people going around and saying, no, but this time is different. To which I'm um, like, yeah, well, but the burden of proof is on you. Um, but certainly it, it, it is, I mean, it requires a leap of faith to believe that this like very, very strong coupling between economic, economic growth, travel activity, and uh, carbon emission, transport related carbon emissions will suddenly decouple to an, ex an extent which is compatible with climate mitigation. It, it really does. Um, so yeah, I think like, um, sustainable transport and degrowth in a way it's a, it's a match because we, <laughs> it, it, it is very hard. Like if you're coming from a sustainable transport perspective to, to believe in that story, right? What, what do you think, Julia? Um, I, I, uh, I, I certainly agree. Um, but I don't know, maybe we're, maybe we're drifting too far and Joey has other questions for us. We could, we could keep going on this topic. No, uh, no, I, th I think it's actually I mean, my next question was about aviation, which is also a big problem on on when it comes to investments and and you know the obsession with growing and prioritizing aviation friendly industries and infrastructures instead of anything else. And the UK is a good example of that, and so is America, unfortunately. But no, no, continue. Uh, I'll just ask it in a bit. <laughs> 
yeah well i guess there's a there's so um the the the, the research that that we did with uh, with julio and cameron and also um uh, andrew brown at leeds was part of this uh, project on living well within limits um that i had the good fortune to acquire and the the as another part of this project, so another research component, we were doing very sort of quantitative, let's look at energy footprints of different income classes kind of thing. And one of the things we found as part of that research is, it's not surprising, but maybe it's surprising how universal it was across the world, is that higher income classes use more transport. So again, this, this idea of the, the environmental Kuznets curve, we also have it as an idea of like rich people can afford to be clean rich people can afford to be green, uh, rich people will have refined immaterial tastes uh, to do with going to the opera and acquiring expensive artwork. And that's maybe true for some people, but it's not true for most people. So what we really see is we really see higher income being translated into uh, energy intensive trans forms of transport, be it flying or car use. Uh, being the two main ones, but also boat use. I mean, why not? All across all categories of transport, we see this, and that means that um, one of the implications with the, for that actually means that uh, because transport is is this poster child for all things, you know, it, it's coupled to economic growth, it's horrifically polluting, um, and uh, requires a lot of resources, emits a lot of carbon, uses up a lot of energy. Um, that it's actually also one of the categories of, of energy use that's the hardest to decarbonize. And if we're going to talk about flying, that's very, very true for the aviation industry, even more so than for the, the automotive industry. But it is a hard to decarbonize sector compared to uh, heat and uh, electricity, which are relatively easy to decarbonize in contrast. And so one of the things that we, we came to the conclusion as a, as a result of the, the research in this project that was just published earlier this year, which is that more equitable societies are easier to decarbonize because if you basically keep people's energy consumption the same, but redistribute it to make it more evenly, to make, make it more economically equitable, what people will use energy on is they will use it on housing. They'll use it on dwellings to have more decent, you know, that's what the vast majority of people aspire to is a decent dwelling with electricity and heat and cooling and all of that and appliances and so on. And that is easy to decarbonize compared to transport. So it's also this question, there's, there's again this sort of class element to it or this, this economic inequality element to it, which I think is also quite interesting. Like the, the question of uh, avi the aviation industry. I had an episode recently, uh, that's episode 65 for those listening, um, with Anne Kretschmar of the, of the Stay Grounded Network. And the title of the episode is, I mean, is the title of the paper that she, she co-authored as well, A Rapid and Just Transition of Aviation, Shifting Towards Climate Just Mobility. So it's it's kind of like the conversation was sort of along the lines of what we're, we were discussing here as well, as you said, our parallels between the two. Um, she discussed many of the ways um, out of the dependency on aviation. Fo fo we focus on Europe, but not just, and we focus as well on the, like, the social aspect of it, how to I also think of the workers that work in the aviation industry so that they, they, they don't just lose their jobs, you know, to actually have transitions in, in a, in a, in a um, social justice oriented manner. I will note, uh, just kind of like as a, as a um, way of ex exemplifying uh, that conversation, uh, just like a few days ago, um, like before this chat, uh, Reuters, and I'm sorry, and we're recording this on April 13th, just for like uh, noting. Uh, Reuters announced that France approved a ban on short domestic flights that can be covered by train in under two and a half hours, uh, you know, which is good. But at the same time, the French government contributed or is planning to contribute 4 billion euros in recapitalization of Air France. Uh, so on the one hand, uh, this is apparently a good move. And on the other hand, as is almost always the case with these policies, coupled with a bad one, it's almost like they had to do something that's good for the environment and then to balance it out, something that's quote unquote good for the economy, and even the logic that they are using uh, is is fundamentally flawed. But as we have been discussing, that's that's often the case. Uh, the French government said that they want to cut emissions by forty percent uh, by two thousand thirty compared to the nineteen ninety levels. There's already that issue. Um, just to kind of bring in, I know that there was a you know a a. Uh, public uh, discussion uh, recently on Twitter 
without mentioning any names, if that's okay. Uh, but I mean, I will link it anyway. Um, you, Julio, especially like you recently re responded to a tweet downplaying the impact of air travel. I will say um, that this is something that I've encountered myself, uh, not just when it comes to air travel, but uh, when it comes to like food, uh, when it comes to transportation in general as well. Um, it is true that a lot of the time focus is like there's too much focus on personal habits and personal consumption. That's definitely true. But what that person was saying, which Julio, you responded to that, is that, you know, basically going the other way around, the other extreme. That doesn't really matter in terms of individual impact, whereas we actually know that it does, especially when it comes to food, which is something that I, I focus on a lot. But anyway, can you um, sort of just uh, explain uh, from your uh, perspective, like, some of these misconceptions when it comes to 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 um, well aviation, but I guess it might even apply to car transport. To be honest, I'm not sure. But definitely, with aviation, is something that I've seen a lot. Um, so yeah, can you just explain a bit of that and why do you disagree with it? Yeah. So I basically, I, I took advantage of that tweet to um, push my own agenda, which was like trying to dispel these uh, misconceptions around air travel. Um, so going through them one by one, like uh, what this person was saying was that uh, flying is just 3% of all CO2 emissions. So there are a lot of things wrong with that. First one being that it's it's not just because something is 2 or 3% of CO2 emissions that you should ignore it. Because if you slice your pie in enough slices, uh, you know, they will all be just 3% of the pie if you have 33 slices doesn't mean that then you just get to ignore all of them. Germany is 2% of CO2 of, of CO2 emissions. That doesn't mean that Germany doesn't get to decarbonize, right? Although some politicians really argue just that. So that's something that we call what about uh, it, I mean, it, it's, it's just not a good reason to, to ignore a sector. Um, um, and I think the best, the best uh, pushback on this, on this um, argument Someone made it on Twitter and they said, look, like China uh, accounts for 20% of global emissions, but China consists of 10 provinces, right? So each of those 10 provinces uh, accounts for 2%. So none of them has to decarbonize, right? Um, so it just goes to show, it's just a reduction of absurdum, right? It just, just goes to show why it, it's, it's just not a, a good argument. But... Like the reason why it's particularly inappropriate for air travel is that actually air travel is incredibly carbon intensive. So uh, like if you wanted to spend an hour and just use it to just contribute to global warming as much as you can, you probably, there are probably very few things that you can do that uh, pollute more than, than just flying, right? So the only reason why it, it, it doesn't account for more than 3% uh, globally is that very few people fly like just the i think it's in the single digits of or 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 10 percent of of people in the world like fly on on a regular basis and they tend to be in in, in the global north and so on uh so it's incredibly uh, unequal and also within countries like in countries in european countries 50 percent or more of the population doesn't fly at all in a in a, in a regular year and then there's a minority of frequent flyers who account for, for, for a whole lot of emissions, even within those countries. So given those equalities, inequalities, the only reason why it accounts for 3% is that very few people do it. And I've got a very colorful metaphor for, 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 for this dilemma, but I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say uh, here. Uh, but um, anyway, it just uh, shows that uh, that argument really doesn't, doesn't hold water. Um, and the other, the other reason is that uh, some people, like the author of that tweet, feel that there is too much attention on, on, on air travel. I, I don't think that's the case. But one of the reasons why, why there is so much attention, at least in the research, I mean, th there isn't that much attention in the research community, but those who push for more attention uh, do it on, on, on various bases. But one of them is that, like, carbon emissions related to air travel are just skyrocketing. Like uh, they've more than doubled in the last 30 years in, in, in Europe, 
like emissions from, from, from international travel. So that's really the opposite of the direction that we should be going. So in sectors like domestic uh, housing, in domestic energy, like things are getting better, not as fast as they should. In things like road transport, they're not getting better, but they're not getting massively worse. They're sort of, I mean, at least in, in, in places like Europe. Um, air travel is just getting massively worse. So uh, it's 3% now, but it will be much more in the future. So we should rather tackle this problem now when it's, you know, something that few people do uh, do um, frequently, uh, rather than in 20 years when it will really be a mass thing and it will be much, much harder to, to, to roll back. So that, that would be my argument there. Um, but then the other argument is that a lot, linking more to the kind of stuff that Julia does, like a lot of air travel is really about luxury, not need, right? Like um, people tend to think that a lot of air travel is for business travel. It's not. Business travel is minority. Like most of um, air travel is for tourism, international tourism, long haul international tourism. Those things contribute a lot to air travel em emissions. So if we need to start cutting somewhere uh, perhaps we should you know start from the you know the, the the third holiday to thailand of someone living in a rich country as opposed from the heating of someone living in a poor country right uh, it just the, this logic of you know wants and needs and luxury and necessities that justifies the attention on on air travel as well uh, from my point of view um Yeah, and the, the last misconception about air travel is that there's this idea that we just need to make public trains better and that that was sorted out, but it's not because like, um, yeah, we, we need to make trains better and things like the French initiative uh, to, to some extent it is a good idea. But um, a lot of the emissions from air travel come from long haul flights and there is really no um, I mean, there are alternatives, but certainly people would not take holidays to the other side of the world in the same way they do now in, in a system that is not based on, on, on air travel. Um, so this idea that we just have to wait until the alternative is ready and then we'll all shift to that and in the meantime, we'll keep flying. It's, it just, just doesn't work. Um, so I think that was enough misconception. Um, I don't know if Julia, you want to add to it? I think I think it's quite complete. But I think one of the things that's really important is, um, and this is something that I think people on the on the on the left in general tend not to be climate deniers as much, but don't really want to touch consumption. And so it's a question of, oh, we shouldn't be touching people's, we shouldn't be touching social progress effectively, and social progress is understood as consumption. So I think that that's already a first not to break is like we need to understand social progress as different from consume consumption and consumerism we have a different story to tell here um, and in terms of my research one of the things we see is we see social progress as being due not to consumerism or individual consumption but to uh, very clearly the availability of public services and uh, that might sound basic but you can see it so so that's one thing the and and in terms of so we have to we have to be willing to face the fact that consumption can't stay the same, can't increase um, like crazy, and that it's like the critiques of GDP. It's like saying GDP is not a good measure of social progress. Not every dollar spent in the economy has the same outcome in terms of its social benefit, and not every kilowatt hour or gigajoule spent in the economy has the same social benefit. And if you're going to look at gigajoules spent with low social benefit, you know, that resulted in a lot of emissions, air travel is pretty much up there. So, so that's also something we really need to start asking ourselves the questions of what we're going to do. And one of the things we can do with flying, because it affects, um, that it really affects the, the, the richest of the rich, is do something like a frequent flyer levy, where your first flight might be cheap, but your second, third, et cetera, the cost goes up. And what you can do with that is you can fund things like housing retrofit to reduce energy poverty among, which is a thing that exists across Europe, where people don't have enough money to heat their houses because it costs too much and the housing quality is sometimes very poor. So there, there are things that we we can really uh, we need to understand how to how to 
help people who need to consume to consume less and better through things like housing retrofit. Um, that is crucially important. Housing retrofit is like the thing that needs to happen. But at the same time, we need to be willing to say this other consumption should stop. It's a problem. We need to tax it. We need to stop it from happening. Uh, and the same thing with consuming large cars, you know, SUVs and four wheel drive cars and so on, which are, that's the drift in Europe. I mean, I can't leave my house without getting whacked in the head by, you know, 17 of them going down these tiny streets. And it's like, nobody needs them. The people who drive in mountains in Switzerland don't have them because they're a risk and they flip over themselves when, you know, when it's steep or icy, that's the last, that kind of top heavy car is the last thing you want. They're only a status symbol. And people often, when they buy them, they don't even realize that they're sort of committing to, you know, uh, riding roughshod over their children's future, basically. So, so I think that we have to be able to problematize consumption and say some consumption is not okay. And uh, some consumption needs to be changed. So that's really something we need to, to face up to. Yeah, I think, thank you both for that. Um, I opened the document just by the, the stake around the network, just to emphasize uh, what, you, what you both just said. Uh, just just in terms of numbers, only 1% of the world's population causes 50% of commercial aviation emissions. So, you know, especially for people on the left, I think, you know, the, the whole 1% should, should ring some bells. Uh, well, more than 80% of the world's population have never set foot on an airplane. This is from the Stay Grounded in PCS discussion paper, February 2021. Um, just other numbers that just kind of put things in perspective. Like as of August 2020, governments or government-backed entities from 57 countries had committed 137 billion euros in taxpayer-funded financial aid, aid to airlines. 38% uh, of the projected revenue loss for airlines for 2020, basically. Um, just, yeah, so many, uh, I won't say too much because the, the other, um, episode was almost exclusively on that, although we did also touch upon degrowth, I should say. Uh, and as you said, uh, Julia, like aviation is the most climate harming mode of transport. And before the pandemic, it was also the fastest growing source of greenhouse gases. Uh, the numbers I actually have here of CO2 and non-CO2 effects account for 5.9% of all human-caused global heating. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, I mean, just to kind of strengthen that that same argument in many ways, uh, this is something that that's a problem and not thinking about it in the global north, especially, uh, which is where we all are and uh, that person making that tweet was as well. And most people usually making that argument from what I've seen uh, are in the global north. Um, that's something that, that I think we, we just don't take into consideration because we don't have to live with the, the consequences of it, at least not in the short term. I have a question about the IPCC, but it will be a bit of a weird pivot. So I will ask something else before. Um, yeah, if that's okay. Yeah. So there is more of a personal question, if that's okay. Um, it, it's one that I've tried to approach in, in these episodes when, when it comes to, to the climate crisis in general, but not just. Um, I know that there's a tendency of, of viewing um, science in general as, as being apolitical. And I think this tends to obfuscate ways in which um, what well, scientists themselves have to work in, in systems in the, in the real world. Um, I, I won't take this too far because I think if I then just say, well, science is political, then some people who are bad, you know, um, not well-meaning, let's say, might then conclude then doesn't matter. It's just one, one form of whatever, among others, and that's obviously not what I'm saying. I, th I think I'm trying to reach some kind of balance between the two, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Uh, Julia, I know this is something that you yourself have has, you know, have spoken about in, in previous interviews. So I wanted to ask you and you both, if that's okay, if you could share a bit of your own journey regarding um, how you've been thinking about science, so not just doing science, but thinking about it, if that makes sense. And also related to that, um, and this is where I, um, I, I, I mean, I, I talk a lot about climate anxiety and a lot about just the, something that I obsess about quite a lot. Uh, how do you deal with a lot of the of the um, psychological challenges, let's say, or like I'm sure you worry about the climate a lot, which which would make sense. Uh, so how do you deal with all of that in in your respective contexts? So um, yeah, I, I guess I can start with that one. So I think. Um... I have a bunch of answers to to these kinds of questions because they they do come up, um, and I think one of the things to realize in terms of climate science, I mean, the natural science is just there. You know, the physical science, the energy engineering. I mean, you can start as soon. The arguments generally start when you get to the economic side of things. How much do things cost? But even there, you can get data, so you can sort of tell. 
Um, but I think uh, one of the things that was not taken seriously enough is that even this climate science and natural science, when it was starting to be published and done more seriously in the, let's call it the 70s, 70s 80s, whatever, when things were starting to, to get started as a topic, that it was entering a terrain that was already politicized by the other side, that it turns out that this science could never be neutral or accepted as a neutral thing because the other side, i.e. the fossil fuel industry, had already done their own science, decided that climate change was real and that they were going to fight doing anything about it forever. And they really made their, they really made their, their, their decision on that quite early and have stuck with it. And so that, I think that was really a nasty shock for scientists to realize that uh, you know, it, it kept coming as a surprise how much attack they were getting. And so for me, one of the things that I want to understand is I want to understand how we've known so much, you know, the, the, the question that Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway asked themselves, which is a research question, a science question, which is how come we knew so much and did so little? So we do is doing a lot of work here. We, some scientists knew so much and we're trying to get the word out and we did so little, well, who has power to do anything, et cetera. Uh, not future generations and so on. I mean, you know, not the global south necessarily, um, but uh, but you know, how come we knew so much and did so little? And and I think one of the reasons, one of the, the, the answer to that is to be found in politics, is to be found in the, the the politicization of the science. So, in my view, it's not possible to be effective in changing course, which is obviously the goal. The goal here is to change course and reduce emissions really fast. And we can't do that if we don't understand how the science has been politicized by what I would call the, the adversary, by an adversarial industry, by adversarial economic and political interests. And so that's that for me is a research question. And the more I learn about it through the work of people like Naomi Oreskes uh, or Jeffrey Supran or Ben Franta or others, the more it radicalizes me, because the more we learn about this stuff, including through lawsuits and other investigations, the more we see how this industry has really been buying up our politicians, buying up our politics, buying up our government, including through these things like road subsidies and you know, in, through direct and indirect means. Our governments are basically funneling tax money to these industries who are trying to kill us. And that makes me angry and that does make me political. That wants me to change the government and it wants me to change the economy. So I would say that my, my politicization is in some sense, you know, you can disagree with the conclusions or you could disagree with whatever, but in terms of asking the questions and trying to understand what's going on, I would say that I'm more politicized by the scientific reality of the way that um, science has been disregarded, that the real, scientific reality of climate science has been disregarded for decades and ineffective for decades and stopped for decades. That's the, that's the thing that's actually turning me to more, the, the answer to why that's been happening is political. And the more you learn about it, the more you want to change the political system. And then of course you get called political, but I would just say that that's, that's where the, that's the terrain of, of the fight. That's the terrain of where change needs to happen is the, the politics and economics of it. Um, so I think that, and what, what I do when people accuse me of being political is I generally point out that, for instance, mainstream economics is not apolitical, <laughs> you know, that if you're taking the side of, uh, neutral markets, um, and supply and demand equilibrium and optimal cost curves, that's not a neutral position. That is a political position. But for some reason, you know, as soon as you, as, as long as you say, oh, well, well things must be cost effective, um, which the fossil fuel industry has never cared about being particularly cost effective, by the way. As soon as you, as, you, as soon as you say that, you're accepted as an apolitical actor and you're invited on television shows to say about how we shouldn't move too fast on climate and so on. And, and we should have a smooth, gradual transition and not have a full on wartime effort. And it's like, that is a political position but you're not calling it that because it's mainstream. So I think it's really about, um, for me, it's, it's also about advocating for a diversity of academic voices. Um, you know, so maybe I'm gonna be called political, but if you're gonna call me political, you better call all those other people that you've been calling apolitical who are rah rah capitalism and growth. That is a political position too. So that's, that's, that's one view. In terms of the, the, the climate, uh, 
depression or whatever, climate anxiety, I think there's a lot of that. Um, the only thing that helps is doing stuff, doing this kind, trying to understand it is sort of the, the, the why we're in the conundrum we're in, because the more we understand about why we're in this pickle, the more we might understand about how to get out of it. So back when people thought it's just about getting the science across, well, it turns out it's not just about getting the science across. The science has always been there. It's always been true. It's about it's about who it, it, you know we and uh, uh, Julia was very very um, uh, influential in, in in putting together this paper on discourses of delay against climate action. You know they they move the discourse. <laughs> the discourse is whatever they want it to be as long as we don't do anything. So for me, it's very um, helpful to be able to participate in research where we understand why we're stuck in at this late 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 time at this late hour and if we understand a bit more about how we're stuck then maybe we understand a bit more about how to get out of it and that's why it's been really um it's been a great thing in my in my life to be able to work with Julio actually because he's very good at doing that kind of stuff about understanding what's going on so i will uh, i will pass it to him uh on that note uh, yeah okay i'll carry on from that but like first of all likewise it was great for me to work with julia uh, i think we complemented each other well in, in many ways um so yeah my my like the way that's just the way I'm, I'm built my mind tends to go to you know the risk of bad things happening and what what prevents what makes us stuck and all things like that and i i realize that for many people these are the topics that people tend to avoid especially in research like like people would be more attracted to you know how how can we make things better how can we you know push this new innovative solution which will solve everything and just i know it's just a question of taste at the end of the day my i my mind doesn't go there but it goes to the other thing it goes to the aviation which is getting worse it goes to the suv which is getting worse and i don't think i have i'm ob i'm, I'm objective of balance uh, in that respect no like I'm, i would i wouldn't want the, the, the scientific community to you know of people like me more than a certain percentage but i think it's 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 good to have people with who are more inclined in, in that way because to, to to balance out right to to to, to make a balance um, and that links to the um, to the question around how we get with the uh, with the whole you know depression around climate and so on i think for me it's it's doing this work and, and working on these topics and being able to work on these topics is almost cathartic in a way because when i i realize sometimes i get bad news like, I don't know, the latest awful thing the certain Ministry of Transport has said about climate policy, which doesn't make sense and contributes to delay. And I realize I'm always, I'm almost happy when I hear those things. I think, oh, I can use it for, for this and that, you know? And then I realize, I mean, I'm, I know it sounds a bit perverse, but uh, I, I, I think it is one way of, you know, taking these this negative things happening and try to harness it and through my work, try and contribute to, to make things better. Uh, and I think in the back of my mind, there's the idea that if, if I can do that, I can perhaps do something good for others as well as good for me, just because I happen to have this psychological makeup. Um, and so that's how it works for for me, having said that, when when it goes from minus twenty to plus twenty in the space of a week or, or, or ten days, like it happened here in Dortmund this spring, and 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 I just look around and see people who are very happy about you know how warm it is, I do feel a bit you know like oh guys, but does anyone else feel like me really? <laughs> but this this can't be right uh so yeah there are moments like that but i think doing this work is a way uh, um, in which i helps me keep sane <laughs> relative to climate i suppose yeah the, uh, just mentioning the, the the temperature changes here in the past uh, couple of weeks as well it's been it's been quite something uh went from one day it snowed in the morning um for like a couple of hours and then i think the afternoon or the day after it was pretty hot 
um it, it just yeah it, it, and yeah I, I wasn't i wasn't what you just said was kind of how i i, I was freaking out <laughs> i just freaked out uh, i had to actually calm myself down i went on a walk um i had to because yeah it's just one of those things and the the way it's it's um talked about even between friends is like well the weather is nice now let's go out you know that's which makes sense but you know there isn't that other uh this is her. but like when you you're mentioning like um uh, I'm also like the both of you. Um, I, I I try and take in as much as I can, but for the for the purpose of actually doing something with it, not just taking it in and then just being overwhelmed with that with that information. Um, but it it contrasted. I, I so I do cultural studies. I watch a lot of stuff and I analyze them. I look at the rhetoric in movies and discourse and that sort of thing. And there is an episode of the the newsroom, the American uh, TV show, which is on climate change. And basically, the host just invites a climate scientist to talk about the climate. And the title of the YouTube video summary, I just found it just to kind of emphasize: it's the climate change debate is long over, and there's nothing we can do. That's, that was the conclusion. It's it's as close as I remember seeing in even in a in a in a one of those TV series that are supposed to be objective. Or at least that that's sort of the that's su supposed to be the you know because it's about journalism. It's about professional journalistic integrity. Always looking for the facts. Always being critical, challenging power, etc. And yet this was just taken for granted. Essentially, that well we lost the battle and there's nothing we can do. Essentially, that was like what ten years ago or something. So this is just one of the many examples in which the, you know, Julia, you're mentioning the the failures essentially of of recognizing the that the um, the playing field um, wasn't neutral, that there was actually playing field in the first place. This this is one of the the ways in which in which that is done. It's either that uh, we shouldn't think about it because quote unquote the economy, or there's no point thinking about it because it's too late anyway, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. But this kind of in a semi-awkward segue, but I think it is re uh, related. A lot of the um, ways internationally, anyway, the, the main institutions have been trying to deal with it uh, is through something like the IPCC, the, the Intercontinental Panel on Climate Change. Julia, if, if you don't mind uh, just mentioning a bit your, your work on that, uh, and I mean, as much as you can share, and if there are challenges, concerns uh, regarding the IPCC or regarding even the the way it's presented or the way it's understood at the you know the public level what have you uh really anything i would just be curious to hear from you on that okay so yeah so i can say a few things i mean um the the, the ipcc is a it's a, so I'm, I'm lead author on working group i mean there's all these acronyms oh my god but like any like any big organization i guess so i'm on working group three which is on climate mitigation um and I think that the division in working groups is actually already a problem. I mean, it kind of makes sense. You want to divide the science up. So working group one is physical science. Working group two is impact and adaptation. Working group three is mitigation, so trying to stop it. And um, one of the reasons the special report on 1.5 degrees, I think, was so effective, because a lot of people know that one is the most one of the most recent comprehensive ones to go come out. And I think, in general, the special reports, there's also been a special report on land and a special report on um, oceans and the cryosphere. Um, but the special report on 1.5 degrees, one of the reasons it was effective is because people from all three working groups were actually working together on it. Now, I wasn't on that one, but I think that that was actually a strength because otherwise we tend to sort of compartmentalize these different things. And it's really when you bring them together in their magnitude, like this is the physics of it, this is the bad stuff that's going to happen. This is what it's going to take to stop it. When you bring it all together, that you really get the 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 full the full magnitude of what we're up against and what needs to change. Um, but the uh, it's basically a glorified literature review. We're supposed to represent all the literature that's come out since the last assessment report. Um, we have a process where we're given we're divided. It's very hierarchical. It's a bit like the army. We're organized in chapters, which is a bit, I guess, a bit like platoons or something. I don't want to take the military um, um, metaphor too far, especially because my chapter bosses might be inspired by it, um, make us do push-ups or something. No, they're lovely. But, uh, but so, so, so we had each chapter, so the, the, chap the division of the content into chapters is done by governments before the scientists, uh, well, some scientists are there at that point. But so we arrive in a chapter, we have to take the chapter themes forward and fulfill the content of that chapter. And then we have this process of iterative review. So 
anybody and their cousin and their cat can be a reviewer. Um, and then we have to take this long spreadsheet of reviews. Uh, so I think um, everybody in my chapter was really happy because this time I think we had less than 2000 reviewer comments on our chapter. But to me, it still seems like a lot. So, <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so you, you, we have to respond and publicly and transparently and take things into account, but also cut it down to length as well. And uh, then we have at the pro end of the you know multiple year process, we have a report. So that's sort of what we're trying to do. Um, at the same time, one of the things that needs to happen in the IPCC is we need to have a summary for policymakers. So we need to bring all the information in the report up to these summary points. So the summary points have to have a clear traceability to content in the chapters that is backed up by lots of science. But we also have to create this sort of consistent narrative story that has that can people can get what what the main points are and that's probably the most challenging part and everybody tries to sort of contribute but it's um uh, and that's also the most contentious part at the end in terms of like the government sort of they they have to agree to, they have to accept the report and at the plenary meeting they go through the summary for policymakers line by line and bring up their disagreements. And then it's a fight, you know, and it could be a fight between governments or a fight between the scientists and the governments. And so that's when things get very um, stressful. And that's also why we're, are the leaders of the IPCC are sort of guiding us towards that process because um, the, more, the more robust the report is, the less that process is difficult, is the general idea. So that's sort of where things are at. Um, and I'm not really, we're not, as authors, we're not allowed to talk about internal discussions and we're not allowed to talk about specifics of what's in the report or not. But um, sometimes I kind of want to because then I could get kicked off and not have to do all the work. So that would be great. So, um, <laughs> but that's that's sort of the, the, the way things are run. Okay. Well, no, thanks for that. I had an episode, so that's 62 for those listening on, on how to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, a societal transformation scenario uh, with Kai Kunham and Linda Schneider. Um, and based on a report that they put, uh, they worked on, they were not the only ones for the Heinrich Boll Stiftung and, and Konzeptwerk Neue Ökonomie. Um, so yeah, just putting it out there. We we talked about some of these uh, topics as well on the IPCC and that sort of thing, and you know, just so that we don't we don't repeat ourselves too much here. I had a question about economics itself, but we sort of answered it already. Uh, I will just ask you, uh, also mostly Julia. Julia, I don't know if you'll have to add, but uh, you know, up to you. Uh, so before entering the book section, I just have like one one question. Uh, Julia, I know that you work in ecological economics. Um, can you just expand, explain what that is? Uh, it's something I'm, I'm personally very curious about. And if you can explain what uh, ecology economics does differently, or at least strives to, to do differently than quote unquote mainstream economics. Sure. And uh, to make things more complicated, there's actually a branch of mainstream economics that does is things related to the environment called environmental economics. And if you don't necessarily care or why would you, it turns out that environmental economics and ecological economics are totally different things. So uh, what ecological economics does differently is it takes the environment seriously as um, a framework condition, a boundary condition. So the economy cannot destroy the environment. So we see ourselves as, we set ourselves as a challenge. We see the, the environmental um, uh, risks that we're facing as a central challenge to the way we should be understanding and doing economics as research. Um, whereas uh, mainstream economics sees the environment as sort of a, a small externality it needs to fix or something or internalize or put a price on. So that is not our approach at all. We're willing, we basically, what we're saying is the economy should respect the, the, the rules and the boundary conditions of our environment so that we don't undermine our life support systems. Um, and that's, that's first, the first condition. And however much we need to transform how we understand the economy and how it should work, we're up for that, including degrowth, including going up against, you know, nobody wakes up in the morning and wants to go up against the central God of our whole societies and civilization <laughs> and say, this is gonna be great for my career. People are gonna take me really seriously. Nobody's gonna accuse me of anything outlandish and it's all gonna go easily and swimmingly. Like nobody wants to do that. N nobody is that insane, but, 
that's where we're at. You know, so if you follow, if you follow the evidence, if you follow the studies or like thereof on decoupling, et cetera, you start, you, you really start getting to the point where you're like, okay, well, this is what we need to explore. And so we're willing to, to rethink the economy in terms of its social purpose. So that's another core aspect of, of ecological economics is we have these, this dual approach. We want inequality to be reduced. We want deprivation to be reduced to nothing. Um, but we also want environmental, the, the, not, not to be putting our entire species and ecosystems at risk through environmental degradation. And then within that, there are lots of different approaches. So it's a big tent. Uh, it's quite pluralistic, maybe a bit too much, who knows? No, thanks for that. Uh, I, I think very visually, and I, I, like, I do like the notion of a donut economics where you just have the, the um, for those who don't know, like you have an upper ceiling of basically the ecological limits and the bottom ceiling is uh, social limits. So like poverty levels, uh, housing, you know, that sort of thing. I'll definitely have some episode on that specifically at some point. Um, well, okay. I mean, with, this has been a really, really um, expansive conversation. I thank you both for it. Uh, if it's okay with you, can we just enter into the book section in which I basically ask you to recommend three books uh, that you like and, you know, just talk about it and explain why you like them. It doesn't even have to be uh, related, but yeah, up to you. Uh, yeah. So do you want, I had, I had three, which were like books, which I read while preparing this paper. Uh, the, um, but I can I can branch out. If, up to you. If, up to you. Yeah. Okay, so then I'll branch out. I like <laughs> um, a few things I've read recently. Uh, there's this book called Spillover about zoonoses. Uh, the author is David Quammen. It's about like zoonoses, so like uh, diseases which pass from animals to humans. And it was published like a few years before Corona, but it's very pre prescient that it says oh maybe the next big one could be a coronavirus and there's a page like that and the reason why i think it it, it fits into this context is that like it's doesn't have to do with climate but it's an it the, the book makes the point very clearly of how like the increase in incidence of these zoonoses has to do with the impact of, of human activity on the environment uh so that just uh you know us going there and cutting forests and in, in, in invading certain animal habitats and so on is the ultimate origin for uh, the fact that these zoonoses seem to happen more and more. So it's another like uh, environmental crisis, if you if you want. Um, and more on the questions of of political and and social justice, I've just read uh, the Grapes of Wrath by what's his name? I forgot. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Faulkner? Yeah, John Steinbeck. Steinbeck, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I forgot the author, but I remember the book. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was that was good. Uh and what else? Um yeah, can I can I stick to those two? Or yeah, yeah, yeah that's fine. Um all right, so I've been trying to, a lot of people have been asking me for reading recommendations, and it's there are a lot of sort of transformative but there, there are a lot of books that sort of help transform or decode the way we can sort of um, see the world. But I think one of the most important ones for me has been um, uh, Decolonizing the Mind by Nguing, I'm going to get his name wrong, Ngugi Wathyongo, who's a Kenyan writer. And that's a short book and an excellent book. And it really um, changes a lot of things. And uh, um, there have been a whole bunch of great books that have come out on degrowth that I've really enjoyed reading, so I'm still going through them. Uh, but Less is More by Jason Hickel and Degrowth and Movements by Matthias Schmelzer were both really good. Um, I've been saying a lot of good things about Less is More, so you should just go go read that one. Uh, well, and also Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth and so on. But um, but uh, I think Degrowth and Movements was very good for me because it basically asks people in different social movements how they see degrowth. And uh, that was really helpful for me in terms of navigating like what a refugee group, a refugee support group, how they would sort of un interact with economic concepts and bring that into their advocacy or how somebody, people who are organizing uh, local bike repair shops, like basically all different kinds of actors in these kinds of social movements and how they, how they see the world. Uh, so I thought that that was really helpful because you don't get that very often, like just asking people, hey, how do you see this? Uh, so I thought that was great. 
Can I have the third one then? <laughs> yes. I yeah. feel bad now, which I haven't. So since Julia hasn't mentioned it, I wanted to mention Ian Goff's book, uh, Heat, Greed and Human Need, which I think is a very good summary of, of man, many of the things where Julia's project was coming from. And, and particularly, he makes a very good case about like why we need to reconfigure consumption, as he puts it. Um, and, and I really like how he writes because it's like when you read something Ian Gobbs like written, it's very hard to deny it. I don't know if you feel the same way, like truly, really, like it just argues in such a, it's such a good way that it, it just leaves you no, no, no way of, you just have to surrender to the argument basically. Um, that's a great yeah. book. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, uh, on that note, uh, thank you both for this. It has really been great uh, and like a really productive conversation. Thanks, Joey. Thank you. These times is made possible by supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support through a monthly donation, you can head out to patreon.com/slash fire these times. If you want to explore other options, you can do so by checking out the website.